All right, ready to dive into some psychology today. We're tackling those popular psych myths, the ones everyone thinks are true, but science is like, hmm, not so fast. Yeah, we're taking those uh, those common beliefs and putting them under the microscope. And our roadmap for this deep dive is an article from Scientific American Mind called Busting Six Big Myths in Popular Psychology. Six myths, huh? I bet we've all heard, maybe even believed a few of these. Like, um, you know how people say venting your anger is healthy? Is it really, though? Yeah. Is blowing your top the way to go? It seems like it makes sense, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> let off some steam. But actually, research going back like like 40 years suggests that expressing anger aggressively, well, it doesn't really help. Hold on. So yelling at that driver who cut me off isn't going to magically make me feel better? Nope, not really. Studies show that venting like that often makes you even angrier and can even lead to, well, more aggression. Remember that movie Anger Management, you know, with Jack Nicholson and Adam Sandler? Oh, yeah, yeah. Nicholson's character was all about just letting loose, but in real life, that's that's not exactly a healthy long-term strategy. Okay, I see your point. So if those primal scream sessions aren't the answer, what is? What does help? Well, research points to calm and assertive communication as being way more effective for dealing with those those heated moments. Interesting. So instead of exploding, maybe explain why you're upset, but in a calm way. Makes you think twice about how to handle frustrating situations, doesn't it? All right, let's move on to another big one. This one's all about learning styles. You know, those quizzes that tell you if you're a visual learner or an auditory learner or a kinesthetic learner. Oh yeah, those quizzes, they're fun, but the science behind those labels is a little iffy, to be honest. Wait, so are you saying those categories don't really mean much? But what about all those articles and workshops I see about, you know, tailoring your teaching methods to those specific learning styles? Well, it's a nice idea in theory, but research hasn't consistently shown that teaching to those supposed learning styles actually helps students get better grades. And, you know, always focusing on what a student's good at might actually prevent them from developing other important skills. Huh. So ditch the labels and focus on just being an adaptable learner. Makes sense to me. What's the next myth we're busting? This one's, well, this one's a bit sensitive for some people. It's the belief that having a positive attitude can, you know, can cure cancer. Oh, wow. That's a heavy one. I know lots of cancer survivors who believe their recovery was thanks to their positive mindset. It's totally understandable to want to hold on to hope in those situations. Oh, absolutely. But we got to be careful about oversimplifying complex issues. Right. Studies haven't found a direct link between positive thinking and survival rates for cancer. While emotional well-being is important, it's not a magic cure. Right. It's not about denying the challenges of a cancer diagnosis, but about focusing on getting good medical care, having a strong support system, and, and keeping up your quality of life during treatment. Exactly. Now let's move on to a myth that's common around addiction, especially with alcoholism. You know that idea that if someone has struggled with alcohol, they have to abstain completely forever. Yeah, the one drink, one drunk idea... I mean, I know groups like Alcoholics Anonymous have helped tons of people achieve sobriety, but I've also heard there's some research suggesting that moderate drinking might be possible for certain people. Yeah, you're right. Data actually suggests that a good chunk of people who were once considered alcoholics, they've managed to drink moderately without relapsing. Really? That's, that's pretty significant. So it's not as black and white as people think. Not at all. How severe the addiction is, the person's circumstances, their individual preferences, it all matters. But it's key to understand that there's no single approach to recovery that works for everyone. So it's all about finding what works for each individual, huh? Okay, let's talk about getting older now. I feel like so many people believe that as you age, you just automatically get, well, sad and lonely, and that your brain starts to go. All right, that's the stereotype we see all the time, right? Yeah. The grumpy, forgetful, lonely, older person, it's everywhere. It's almost like we're expected to just accept that decline and misery are inevitable parts of aging. But the research says something different, doesn't it? It does. Studies actually show that happiness tends to increase with age. Older adults often report um, higher levels of well-being and life satisfaction compared to younger folks. And cognitive decline, while it's a normal part of aging, isn't always as drastic as people fear. So maybe those golden years really are more golden than we think. All right, what else have you got for us? Well, let's talk about grief. There's this common belief that everyone experiences loss the same way, like step by step, you know? Think of those five stages of grief. Denial, 
anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Oh, right. The famous Kubler-Ross model. Remember that acronym, D-A-B-D-A? -A. I feel like I see it everywhere. But is it really that, uh, that straightforward? Well, while the Kubler-Ross model is a useful framework, we have to remember that not everyone goes through those stages in a predictable order. And some people might not experience some of the stages at all. Grief is a very personal thing. So there's no single right way to grieve. Exactly. Trying to fit everyone's experience of grief into one rigid model just doesn't do justice to how complex human beings are. It's more about respecting individual journeys, not imposing a set path. That's a great way to put it. Wow, we've covered a lot already, haven't we? We have, and I'm ready for more. Can't wait to keep busting these myths in part two. Stick with us, folks. There's much more myth busting to come. Back for more deep dive action. We're picking up where we left off, still exploring those sneaky psychology myths. You know, the ones that just won't go away, even when the science doesn't back them up. Oh, yeah. They definitely have a way of hanging around. Ready for round two of myth busting? Hit me with it. What's myth number seven? Okay, so this one is about the idea that there's like a universal process for dealing with death, like one size fits all. I'm talking about the Kubler-Ross model, the five stages of grief. Oh, yeah, right. D-A-B-D-A. -A. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. I remember learning about that, but isn't that kind of uh, outdated now? It is. It's a well-known framework, right. but it doesn't really capture you know, the messy reality of grief. Research actually suggests that people don't necessarily experience those stages in a linear step-by-step -step way. And some people, well, they might not go through all of them at all. So it's not as simple as just checking off those five boxes and then poof, you're done grieving. Nope, not at all. Grief is so individual, you know? Yeah. Shapes by your personality, your culture, mm. the kind of loss you've experienced, so many things. It's more like navigating a maze, not following a straight line. Speaking of paths, let's jump to myth number eight. This one is about multitasking, the idea that we can juggle a bunch of tasks at once and still be effective. Ah, multitasking. <laughs> the, the holy grail of productivity, right. Mm. But is it all it's cracked up to be? That's what I'm wondering. I feel like we're almost expected to multitask these days, like it's a badge of honor or something. But honestly, when I try to do too many things at once, I just end up feeling scattered and stressed. Yeah, there's a reason for that. Our brains are actually wired for focus, not for juggling multiple things at the same time. We can switch between tasks pretty quickly, but true multitasking, where you're giving equal attention to several things at once, it's not really possible. Hmm. But isn't there research showing that some people are better at multitasking than others? Like, isn't it a skill you can develop? There might be some individual differences, sure. But overall, studies suggest that multitasking actually makes you less productive and more prone to errors. When we divide our attention like that, we end up sacrificing quality for quantity. So maybe instead of trying to do everything at once, we should focus on single tasking, you know, giving our full attention to one thing at a time. What do you think? Absolutely. Setting aside dedicated time for specific tasks and minimizing distractions can make a huge difference in how productive and focused we are. It's about working smarter, not just harder. That's a great takeaway. Okay. Ready to tackle the last myth for this part of our deep dive. Bring it on. Let's talk about <laughs> subliminal messages. The idea that hidden messages, like in ads or self-help tapes, can influence our thoughts and behavior without us even realizing it. Oh, that sounds kind of spooky, like something out of a sci-fi movie. Is there any truth to that? Well, the idea of subliminal messaging has been around for a while, but the scientific evidence supporting it is, well, it's pretty weak. So those self-help tapes promising to boost my confidence with subliminal messages are probably not going to work. Probably not. Some studies show they might have some subtle short-term effects on things like preferences, but there's no real evidence that subliminal messages can create big, lasting changes in how we behave. I guess that makes sense. It would be pretty freaky if we were all being constantly manipulated by hidden messages. <laughs> right. But even though subliminal messaging might not be the powerful force it's made out to be, it's still fascinating to think about how our subconscious minds work. Definitely. And speaking of fascinating, we have a few more myths to unpack in the final part of our deep dive. So stay tuned, folks. We'll be back to explore some misconceptions about memory, personality, and even happiness. All right, we're back, ready for the final part of our deep dive into psych myths. I feel like I've learned so much already, but I'm definitely ready for more. What other misconceptions are we uh, are we tackling today? Get ready for some real mind benders. We're going to explore some common beliefs about memory, personality, and even, you know, even happiness. Yep. Let's start with memory. You know, people say it's like a video recording of the past. Oh, yeah. I've always kind of thought of memories as like 
pretty accurate representations of what happened, but I have a feeling you're about to tell me that's not really the case, huh? You got it. Unfortunately, no. While our memories can feel super vivid and real, they're actually quite uh, malleable, prone to distortions. You know, It's more like we're reconstructing the memory each time we recall it, not replaying it like a video. So, so every time we remember something, we could be accidentally changing it a little. That's, that's kind of unsettling. It is, and those little changes can add up over time, right? They can be influenced by our emotions, our beliefs, even later experiences. That's why eyewitness testimony, for example, can be so unreliable. Even when people are totally confident what they remember, their memories might have been influenced by stress or leading questions or even, you know, even their own biases. Wow, that's a good reminder to be a little skeptical of our memories, especially in, in important situations. Okay, what about personality types? Is it really true that people fall into distinct categories like introvert versus extrovert? Ah, that's a myth that's become super popular, even showing up in all those personality tests. But it's actually way more nuanced than that. Most people don't fit neatly into those extreme categories. So are you saying most of us are kind of somewhere in between those two extremes? Exactly. And even within ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, our, our levels of introversion and extroversion can shift depending on the situation, who we're with, how much energy we have. It's not like fixed. That makes sense. I mean, sometimes I'm totally the life of the party and other times I just want to curl up with a good book and, and be by myself. So it's less about being labeled an introvert or an extrovert and more about understanding the the different size of our personality, right? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Okay, for our last myth, this one's about happiness. It's the idea that we can achieve, you know, lasting happiness by going after external stuff like wealth or success. Oh, yeah. The classic, when I achieve X, then I'll be happy trap. I think we've all fallen for that at some point. But I have a feeling true happiness is a little, um, a little more complicated than that. You're right. External achievements can definitely contribute to our happiness for sure. But research suggests that lasting happiness comes more from uh, our internal state of mind, mm. our relationships, our sense of purpose. So it's less about what we have and more about like how we experience the world yeah. and how we connect with others. Exactly. Happiness is an ongoing journey, not a destination. Right. It's about cultivating gratitude, practicing mindfulness, nurturing those relationships, and finding joy in the simple things. Wow, we really covered a lot of ground today. It's amazing how much these myths can like shape our beliefs and even how we act, but honestly, I feel like I'm walking away with a way better understanding of these topics now. Me too. It's been a great reminder of how important it is to think critically and, and to always stay curious about the world. You know. So to all our listeners out there, keep questioning those assumptions, keep learning, and keep exploring this amazing world of psychology. Who knows what other myths we might uncover together. Yeah, exactly. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive. We'll be back soon with more explorations of the human mind and how we behave.